You are an unparalleled motivational preacher. And, and I use that word very intentionally. You have a way of conveying a message with such chills, inspiring, goosebump giving power. It's really, really extraordinary to witness and becomes all that much more powerful knowing that you didn't start there, that that wasn't sort of naturally, you know, your, your beginning. And you've called life a, a battle for territory. Yes. What do you mean by that? The, the things that you get in life, you know, Frederick Douglass said, we might not get everything that we fight for, but everything we get, it will be a fight. <laughs> so, and I love the quote that life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. Like getting ready to come here to see you. I want to just, first of all, thank you for the great work that you're doing. I watch you and I study you and you have had some incredible guests that impacted my life. and. And preparing to come here, I'm being treated um, by uh, Cancer Centers of America for fourth stage cancer, which I've been kicking cancer's butt for 27 years. And I've been working on getting a six pack before getting here. <laughs> I still got one pack. <laughs> but I, and I've been working to get some muscles so I can wear my t-shirt, but they weren't large enough, so I wore a long sleeve. <laughs> That's amazing, man. Talk to me about cancer. You've had such an upbeat attitude about it. It's really pretty extraordinary. Was that your initial reaction? Did you go through a trough of despair when you first got diagnosed? Like, how have you framed that? Dr. Alfred Golson, uh, who has since passed, was a very unusual guy. And he told me, he said, Mr. Brown, you have cancer. I said, can you give me a second opinion? He said, yes, and you're ugly too. <laughs> said, oh my God. <laughs> so I didn't have a chance to, to, to have fear because the, you know, those three words, you have cancer, three of the most feared words in seven different languages. I saw it as a fight. And, and, and from that time to this time, you know, my PSA was 2,400. And that stands for prostate specific antigen, and, and now it's below zero and metastasized to seven areas of my body, which was a good thing because seven is my lucky number. <laughs> okay, so it no, I, I I never was fearful that I was going to die from it, and and I think that I read something by Dr. Norman Cousins. He wrote a book called The Biology of Hope, and he talked about the fact that. When something happens to you, you don't deny it, you defy it. And I was defiant that I'm going to beat this, I'm going to handle this. That there are people who many times when something happens to them, that they embrace it from a place of fear and it takes them out. And Elsie Robinson said, things may happen to you and things may happen around you, but the most important things are the things that happen in you and you have to stand up inside yourself and deal with it and handle it. So fortunately, that never bothered me, but I had sciatica pain. That had me speaking in unknown tongues. <laughs> and I was in a wheelchair for several months, speaking from the wheel, a wheelchair. And it was something that I, I dealt with that frightened me. Will this ever end? It was 24 hours. I lost a lot of sleep. It was exhausting going from all types of specialists in and out of the country. And just one day, it stopped. And I'm glad that I'm past that, you know. I just, I, I feel like uh, when, you, when you go through some stuff, you just, there's some certain things that you don't want ever to see again. And that's what I don't want to ever see again. But fear has not been the biggest challenge that I've faced with the things that I've been dealing with in terms of my health. Well, talk to me about the process that you go through mentally. So there have been a few times in your life in getting to know your story where they seem like really key inflection points. Um, being told that you were teachable but mentally retarded, that for sure is something that would define most people and they would have a hard time escaping that. Um, being told that you have cancer, that it's stage four, that um, they don't know how to treat it, like that's something that consumes most people. How do you build that resilience. So maybe by the time you get to cancer, you've already done so much work. So I get maybe how that one you're, you're protected by the mechanisms you've built. But in the beginning, how did you crawl out from under the labels that people were putting on you? The easiest thing I've done was to get out from under the labels. 
and to live the life that I live. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do it. What's the difference? Uh, the difference is that when you don't know what's impacting you, and it's, it's something that, that's holding you down and you're not aware of it. Uh, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead was in a restaurant in London, and, and a guy was serving her and said, there's several Americans here tonight. And she said, is that right? Yeah. So let me know when you serve them dessert. I'll tell you exactly how many are here. He said, oh, you couldn't possibly. And so he came back and said, okay, I've done it. And she got up and she walked around and she came back and she said, there are around 25 here. And he looked at the roster. How did you know that? Say so in America, we eat differently from you when we eat a dessert. You eat it from the crust toward the tip. We eat it from the tip toward the crust. When you eat a slice of pie, how do you eat yours? Uh, definitely, yeah, from the, the tip back to the crust, for sure. Yeah, okay, and so, so there are things that when you, in, in my situation, when you live in a dominant culture that is designed to destroy your sense of self and your belief in yourself, and, and you have to learn ways in which you can begin to connect with this power that you have within yourself to handle where you are. The key is to be constantly in a perpetual process of discovering the truth of who you are and fighting constantly to look for ways in which you can escape the inner conversation. I speak to audiences around the world and I, and I train speakers as well and I, I tell them that when you speak that there's, a, there's an objective that you want to achieve when you speak to an audience because how people live their lives is a result of the story they believe about themselves. So you as a speaker, when you speak in this program, when people see you, what you do is distract, dispute and inspire. You distract people from their current story with your guests and the questions that you ask through the process of the ongoing questioning and the way in which they respond and the things they have learned, you dismantle their current belief system and inspire them to, to create a new chapter with their lives. And so, but that's an ongoing process. Of, of constantly interrupting that conversation, what psychologists call your self-explanatory style, because life is, is going to beat up on you in so many ways, and many things, they come back, you know, negative thoughts and, and how you feel about yourself, they don't die, they, they come back once you stop doing the maintenance work on your mind listening to motivational messages, going to seminars and workshops, spending time quietly listening to the still small voice within. Uh, who am I really? Is this really me? Am I giving my best? Uh, am I just reflecting what's around me? Because all of these various things affect how we show up in life. And so having a strategy to continuously uh, find ourselves reaching higher, of, Robert Shuler had a book, it's not very popular, but I loved it. It's called Peak to Peak, U-P-E-A-K to P-E-E-K, because you're constantly reaching higher to find out and discover your, your better self. How would you respond when someone's back is up against the wall, they're facing failure, failure time and time again? Let me just share a little quick story. Years ago, I worked with Tony Robbins. In 1999, I was working with Tony Robbins. I thought, model one of the best. It was either you, Stephen Covey, or it was Tony Robbins. And at the time, Mike, I had a little connection into Tony Robbins. So I went with Tony Robbins. Yes. And I got so pumped after a year of working there, I gave over 240 presentations. What a great training opportunity as I traveled the country and just was able to present so many times. And finally, he sat on stage Talking about living your dreams, he said, when would now be a good time? He told the 5,000 people audience. And I remember I nudged my wife and I said, that's my, that's my calling. I, I, I'm making an excuse for myself. It's time for me to go live my dream. Anyway, long story short, I left the Tony Robbins organization. I called my parents. I said, mom, dad, can we and the kids stay at your home for just a couple months as I do my first seminar. Our other home, our home was actually rented out at the time because we were traveling so much, so I couldn't go there. 
And mom and dad said, absolutely. Well, those two months turned into five years in the basement of their house. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh. And in my darkest moment, I took, my wife says, you should go get a job. I said, but my, I hear Les Brown in me, right? My calling is to do this. I, there's got to be a way. I can't just give up on the 10 yard line or whatever. And she said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, honey, I'm going to go write a book. And she said, you're going to do what? You're going to do you, Have you even read a book? Anyway, I said, I'm going to go write a book. And we had a car repossessed. So we ended up with one card. And I decided I can't write where the kids are. So I drove down to the grocery store parking lot and I started to type. And two months later, if you think you can, was, pub was written. And I'm telling you, it was published about three months later. And from then, my world in 2005 turned overnight. That book became an international bestseller back in 2005. And we just came out with the, with the 15th version. It's coming out next week. And so it's, it's just unbelievable. As I have always told audiences, believe in yourself, believe in your dreams, figure out the right strategy, but never, never give up. I don't know, how, how do you counsel people to respond to those kinds of challenges without giving up? Well, first of all, we always have a choice. There's something in us, TJ, as you know, that's greater than anything that we face, even though we have no evidence to point to, to prove it. Like as I'm speaking to you now, that's right. I have to prepare myself mentally because I'm in pain as I speak to you. The cancer has eaten 40% of my T1 vertebrae and metastasized to the T2 to T3 and to the C7. Uh, and I, I just spoke to an audience this morning and I said, a doctor looked at me and, and, and he said three words that no one ever wants to hear. He, he said, you have cancer. And the audience got quiet and I said, sir, can you give me a second opinion? He said, yes, and you're ugly too. <laughs> That's good. I said, no, I said, I got issues. I got issues. <laughs> here's, here's the thing. Life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. So I could have said, and I, even now I could say, this pain is just too great. But my affirmation to myself, whenever I'm going through a tough time, and I'm a 27 year cancer conqueror, no matter how bad it is, or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. And I think that people who make it through the storms of life, and we're always going to have storms. Forrest Gump said life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. My book of life says that Think it not strange that you will face the fiery furnaces of this world. You will, not you might. You will have tribulations. It's called life. And so what's key is to visualize and see yourself on the other side and, and hold that vision. He said, I'll give you all your eyes can see. Hold that vision and say to yourself, wow, that came out great. I made it through. I learned some things every day. For 27 years, I've been saying, I thank God I'm cancer free. And people say, wait a minute, you've been saying that for 27 years. I mean, obviously it's not gonna happen. I said, no, that's not true. Number one, I'm still here. Augmentino say, persist until you succeed. Well, just think 27 years, look, when will a baby walk? It will walk when it walks. When will it talk? It will talk when it talks, and some talk sooner than others. And so many times we give up out of frustration and lack of patience. And to me, the people that make it through have a series of, of, of perseverance, persistence, and patience. And they show up with that every day until they get the desired results that they want. I know, there's not, I don't believe, I know that I'm going to be free of cancer, that this is not a, unto death. There's something that I have to align myself with because cancer is cells gone crazy. And so as I'm working on myself and working on the goals and dreams and other areas of my, my life that I have not resolved yet, 
that I'm just persistent and I'll keep coming back again and again and again. And as I told my children, even a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> A <laughs> brother's going to break through. That is, that is so awesome. Despite your the cancer challenge, if you call it a challenge or not, um, you're still nice out because you get to know things about yourself that you don't know. Yeah, right. That it introduces you to a part of yourself that you're not familiar with. That it helps you to begin to prioritize things and determine what's important, what's not important. The things that I would get angry about that. I just let pass. For instance, I was coming down the sidewalk yesterday when I arrived here in New Jersey, in Philadelphia, and a guy had his luggage on the sidewalk and he saw me coming. All he had to do is just pull his luggage back so that I can come by. He refused to move it. He's standing there with his wife. And so, which meant that I had to move my luggage and carry it into the streets and then get back on the sidewalk. And so he said, good, I'm glad you did that. And I said, thank you. And I got into the, the car that was waiting for me. And I said to my friend, I said, you know what? <laughs> there was a time that I'd have whooped his ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted to look at him at one time. I said, you about to make me lose my mind. Up in here, up in here. I took my stuff on the sidewalk, and that wasn't enough. You wanted to taunt me. You wanted to tease me. You, you want to act like you pumped me out. And I said, but at 74, no, because every emotion, I mean, I laugh a lot. Why? One minute of laughter boosts your immune system for over 24 hours. Think about that. One minute of laughter boosts your immune system for over 24 hours. So people who are watching us now, after we get through, they will get sick for 20 years. <laughs> so one minute of laugh of, of anger weakens your immune system for four to five hours. Yeah. So I deliberately don't get angry. I choose not. Anger is a wind that blows out the lamp of the mind. I study psychoneuroimmunology. I know that the, the thoughts that we have, they create gene expressions. I know it creates a certain type of chemistry in our body that's toxic. And so I can't afford, as, as a cancer conqueror, to get angry. I choose not to go there. And, and we always have a choice. And I believe that uh, the type of program that you have, it gives people the mental and emotional and, and, and psychological and spiritual muscle to have a clarity of mind to stand back and say, you know what, I'm not going to go there. I, I, I'm not going to let this get to me. I'm better than this and rise above it and move on with their lives. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you for sharing all that. I, uh, You said, you, you put a little nugget in there I like, which I want to draw attention to. But you just said some people give up on their goals because they lack patience. And that made me think of the law of the harvest, which has three laws, right? You reap what you sow. Yes. Increased returns. You get more than you sow, right? right. And then the third thing is delayed gratifications. And so sometimes we give up on our goals. Uh, because we haven't given time for those seeds to, to nourish and bear fruit, right? We give up a little bit too early. And I, anyway, any thoughts on that? Yes, well, there are some things that you're pursuing. I, I see that, that we grow from people and from projects. I'll be a better person at the end of this program because of our communication. We grow mm. from people and projects. And so when we have projects, they challenge us. Why? Because we always, if we want to grow into a serious, choose projects that's beyond our comfort zone. Because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. That's good. And so there are experiences that you're going to have in the process. Some things will happen to you and some things will happen for you. And so I believe that those things that happen for us that sometimes we're aware of, but most of the time we're not. That's what psychologists call your scotomas, your blind spots. Right. That a, a, a lady, she's an intuitive, and she she wrote me a note when she found out that I was a 27-year cancer conqueror, and she says, this is not unto death to you. She said, search your heart and find out what's there. Because, and she was one of the people that gave me a book years ago that I read called, Who's the matter with me? 
And what I realized, TJ, and this is the first time I've ever talked about this publicly, that uh, somewhere in me that I had not consciously recognized that I had anger at my birth mother and father. How could you bring someone in this world who didn't choose to be here and walk away? And even though we are told forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I woke up in the middle of the night and sometimes you can get a message from a movie. Right. And it was a movie with Tom Cruise as Carl Magnolia. And I never saw the whole movie, but the, there was a quote that woke me up around 3.15, I'll never forget. And the quote was, we might be through with our past, but our past is not through with us. And so I have unresolved stuff in me because for a period of time, I saw myself as being, have been given away, but there's been a shift in my consciousness. Now I look at my life and I realize I was chosen with love, that God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And that's why I know now that I've come to grips with, now that someone, I had to get some help, but I believe ask for help, not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong yes. and ask for help and don't stop until you get it. And I said, you said, this is not unto death for me. Search my heart. And I said, can you help me go there? And she did, because sometimes somebody can take you to a place within yourself that you can't go by yourself. And in that session, I realized the anger and, and the hatred that I had for two people that I, I, I don't even have faces for. I've never seen my birth mother, a birth father. And, and so I had to resolve that. I had to forgive myself first and then forgive them. And that's when the healing takes place because cancer of cells gone crazy. Yeah. And so now as I move to a place of love, God is love, and he who dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in them. As I move to a place of love for them, that that now I'm in harmony and in integrity who, with who I am as a person, and I have forgiven myself, I've forgiven them, and I'm living this mission of making the world a better place than how I found it of being a source of light and hope and inspiration for people. And you're doing an awesome job. There is no long-term benefit for being a grudge holder, um, holding resentment toward people. I always tell people, the people say, well, do things bug you? Well, things bug me, but listen, yeah. I don't, I don't live there. And I always tell people, I let things roll off my back. You can criticize me all day long. And you know what? I'm not going to internalize that. Yes. Right? because I know who I am and I'm thankful for who I am anyway. Yes. And, and that is real because the stuff we take on is, is, is that hating someone is like drinking poison and, and, and say, okay, now you're going to die. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen like that. Yes, no. We, we all need coaching on how to let some things go. One of the things that I teach is let go or be dragged. That there are certain things that you know that you need to let go of. Otherwise, it's gonna compromise your power and it's gonna drag you down. And yeah, it takes time to do that. It does, it does. So in your book, I remember this story. Yeah. Such a great book. Anyway, um, you walked in, I think it was to a junior high or an elementary school, and you said, there's greatness in this room. If you're here, would you please stand? Yes. And you had to say it over <laughs> and over. And then yes. one one young person, didn't they stand up and they said, up, here I am. Yeah. Here I am. And that young man, I'm working with him today. Oh, you're kidding. No, he's been with me since that time. He, he's an attorney and he also worked with youth. We go to prisons and juvenile detention centers together. Yes, and he's truly manifesting his greatness. And I'm proud to say I'm one of his mentees because it's a seesaw relationship. At first, I started out being his mentor, but he has incre incredible skills with the millennials 
and with technology that I don't have. Oh. And so he's teaching me how to connect with them and how to use technology to further the work that I have that I'm doing and to create non-performance income. So this thing called life, I believe that you, you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. And he's teaching me and I, I'm proud of it. That's awesome. Take responsibility for your life. Take responsibility for your life. Now that's a very important. Remember what, what, what Bishop said last night about Adam? Adam, when God asked him what happened, Adam did not want to take responsibility for what he had done. Men have always tried to escape that. Now you know that we believe a lot in marches. Let me tell you something, here's a march I like to enroll you on. I want a million men to march to a mailbox to give support payments, just drop some support payments in the mailbox to children that you have helped to create, that you have been irresponsible and you're not taking care of. Don't give that money to the airlines or the bus stations or the hotels. Send that money to those mothers that are still there dealing with and raising those children. Own your stuff. Come here, owner. Where's my daughter? Come here, owner. I got a call five years ago from this person here. I happened to be at the office late at night. See, I believe in being open and being honest with you. And the call was, tell them what you said to me. I said, um, if you had a child in this world that you were unaware of, a descendant in this world that you were unaware of, would you or would you not want to know? What did I say? You said, yes, I would want to know. So I told her I wanted to know. And I said, send me some pictures. She sent me some pictures overnight. I saw this smile. I said, that's mine. <laughs> Sent one of my sons to pick her up. He drove her from Columbus to Detroit. He came in first and said, Daddy, my sister's right behind me. And we've been together ever since. And I'm not ashamed of her. I can't unscramble these eggs and don't want to. But I have to take responsibility that this is my daughter. And I take care of my daughter. Ain't she gorgeous? I'm trying to fatten her up. She got little legs. I'm trying to find a husband while we're here. <laughs> got legs so small you can sue them for non-support. That's why she wearing pants. <laughs> but, okay, thank you, baby. Give her a round of applause, all right? Now, so the reason I'm, I'm telling you that we got to start owning our stuff as men. Don't make no big deal. Can you imagine what will happen if a million men decide to go to the mailbox and just unexpectedly drop just what you can? Don't have to have a, a you know, return address in case they're looking for you. You don't have to put that on there. <laughs> If you real behind, you understand what I'm talking about? I ain't say be no fool now. <laughs> now the only reason I can put a return address on this because I have an MBA. Somebody say, oh, I got you. I thought you you don't have a college degree. I don't. The MBA stands for Mega Bank Account. <laughs> so anyhow, join me, man. Don't tell me, well. I don't like her, she got an old man, or she don't need my money, or the children don't look like me. I went to, to court in the fraternity suit with a friend of mine named Ronnie, and he went to the judge, Judge, why don't you pay child support? He said, the babies don't look like me, the judge said, well, feed them till they do. See, we can't teach our sons to be responsible if they don't see us being responsible. If they don't feel that we care, 
So don't say, well, I don't have it. Get it! That doesn't let you off the hook right down the next R. And that is not only responsibility, but be resourceful. A lot of men, I don't have it. I had it, I'll give it. If the women had that kind of attitude, the children would starve to death. The reason that they eat, the reason that they have some place to stay and to lay their heads and have clothes on their backs because the women decide I'm going to make it happen no matter what and they're resourceful. My mama raised seven without a man. She cooked. She cleaned houses. Here's something else that will cause you to reach your goals when you leave here. Write this down. Reasons. Compelling reasons. While you're here, when you make this covenant with God, when you decide to live like a conqueror, when you decide to become more successful, to create wealth, to be a change agent in your community, what is it that can keep you on the straight and narrow that will cause you to keep your commitment to your commitment? I used to do door-to-door -door sales with a man named Sam Axelrod. Sam Axelrod was intrigued by me because when he came to pick me up, he didn't have to blow his horn. I was downstairs waiting for Sam when he came around the corner. And unlike the men that work with him and other young people, when it got dark and Sam blew the horn, everybody ran to the station wagon. And they would do a head count and they say, who's here? So everybody's here except Les. And they say, hey, Les, come on. No, I'm not coming, Sam. Why? I haven't sold anything. No one sold anything, Les. It's a long run from Liberty City to Overtown. You got to pass the 20th Street Sharks and the 14th Street Gang. The Jitneys will stop running soon. I can't stop, Sam, until I sell something. See, my reason for going door to door, different than everybody else. Most people out there are trying to make some extra money to party on the weekend, or to buy a new outfit, or a new bicycle. The reason that I was working was to take care of my mama. The reason that I was working is because I was working on Miami Beach with my mother. And she's working for a family called the Sadursky family. And one day when I was outside raking the yard, I came in and my mother was on the floor, on her knees, cleaning up some grease spots that Mrs. Sadursky had spilt some grease. My mother was 56 at the time. She adopted us when she was 40. And I came in, my mother had arthritis in her knees. And I could hear her moaning at different times when she moved on her knees on this hard linoleum floor. And I said, Mrs. Sadursky, can I do that for my mother and you can have her do something else? She said, if it's all right with Mamie. And my mother said, no son, that's all right. I said, no mama, it's not all right. I don't want you on your knees, Mama. Please, let me do it, baby. And I helped my mother up. And Mrs. Sadursky said, Mamie, go in the other room and find that hat I was looking for earlier. And my mother went in the other room. And I heard her clapping her hands. I said, Mama. She said, what, boy? I said, baby, why are you clapping your hands? She said, don't worry. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Then after a while, Mrs. Sadursky said, Mamie, maybe it's in the other room. Go look in there. Mama went in the other room and sure enough, she started clapping her hands again, Bishop. I said, Mama, why are you clapping your hands? She said, didn't I tell you to pay attention to what you're doing? Then at that moment, Mrs. Sadursky came over. She said, I can tell you why she's clapping her hands. I said, why, ma'am? She said, well, because when I have domestic workers looking for something, and they're out of my view, I make them clap their hands to make sure that they're not stealing. I put the scrub brush down and I stood up. I said, excuse me, Mrs. Sadursky. I don't mean any disrespect, ma'am. My mother raised us to say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. But my mother's a Christian. She would never steal from you or anyone. When my mama talk about your children, when she talks to her friends, she say, my children, the Sadursky children. She loves you and your husband and your children. She would never steal from you. And she just walked away. Later that evening, when we were riding across the Venetian causeway, I was very quiet. And my mother noticed it. I was not my bubbly self. 
She said, what's wrong, son? I said, mama, I wish I was a man. She said, boy, you're 16 years old. You'll be a man soon enough. I said, no, mama. I want to be a man now because if I was a man, right now, we would never have to wear somebody else's hand-me-down clothes that their children no longer want. I'll be able to buy clothes for my brothers and sisters and you. If I was a man, we would never have to eat anybody's leftover food that you cooked for. Because I'll be able to buy us groceries if I was a man. If I was a man, mama, no one would ever have you on your knees cleaning up grease that they spill. And nobody, nobody would ever, ever make you clap your hands because they think that you're stealing. If I was a man, mama, I'll take care of you. She said, Mrs. Sidersky told you that, didn't she? I said, yes, ma'am. So I was a man, you would never cook for anybody but me. My mama used to fix the kind of sweet potato pie that you couldn't eat with your shoes on. You had to take your shoes off so you can wiggle your toes. And when we would go door to door, sometimes as late as 10 o'clock at night, I would knock on the door. Who's there? Would you like to buy a nice working television set? No money down? Boy, are you crazy? Yes, I am crazy. I'm crazy about my mama, and I'm going to take care of her, and I'm going to sell a television set tonight, and it might as well be you. And after a while, somebody would say, come on in here, boy, and that better be a good set. One of the reasons, write down why you're here at this manpower conference, write down five compelling reasons of why you're going to keep your commitment to change your life, keep your commitment never to go back to the life that you once lived, keep your commitment to creating wealth for yourself, to taking care of your children, to be more responsible, to manifest Christ in you, in your life, in your community, keep your commitment to live a life of contribution, to keep your commitment to be a conqueror, and to act like it, and to have authority and dominion of everything in your life. What are those reasons I got on one of my tapes, if life knocked you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up you can get up your reasons will help you to get back up again there'll be your rod and staff to comfort you so you got to write down five reasons and everything that Bishop is saying and and Bishop Merritt and all the different speakers and the relationship seminar that brother Lewis Greenup will do how you will incorporate the principles from this manpower conference in your life and live them and manifest them and support them. Last night we did our Hungry to Speech training we do on Thursday nights. What I, I, I shared with people, how you can have a story or you don't have to have a story. How the best speakers are the best listeners. And so I listen very deeply. And some of you have seen me take someone's story. I will ask, can I take a swing at it? And they say, yes. And so, and then I do a piece with it and they say, how you do that? <laughs> well, uh, this is something that I love. And, and so I'm always listening. So the best speakers listen, not just with their ears and not being judgmental, but listen with their hearts and what touched them. So I'm going to give you an example. And this is something that coaches and salespeople and multi-level marketing people and speakers and just business people should use as a strategy to learn how to become more effective and think on your feet. And if you're called upon to give a presentation, listen closely when you're in meetings and sitting and, and taking notes that if something that gets touch you, then, then you can use that. So I'm gonna give you an example. Last night, one of our members in Hungry to Speak, one of the speakers said last night, God's up to some amazing stuff. God's up to some amazing stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, as you look at yourself, look at your goals and dreams. As, as we look at all that's going on in the midst of the pandemic, in and out of it, here's what we know. God is up to 
some amazing stuff with your life. Because in this thing called life, it's about growth. This thing called life, it's about handling and transforming ourselves to accommodate the disruptions of life. This thing by life and where we are right now, it's full of distractions. And so as you look at yourself, look at your goals and dreams, what's most important is just keep focus and allowing yourself to be fueled by your faith. My son, John Leslie said that your faith is a down payment on your future. Come on, somebody. Yes, your faith is a down payment on your future. Focus on your faith, not your problems. Focus on your faith, not your bills. Focus on keeping yourself strong, living yourself, and living from the inside out. Because the problems and challenges, they will always be there. Dimples was right when he had that so. If it ain't one thing, it's another. That's absolutely true. If it ain't one thing, it's another. That's a part of life. And so here's something else. Not only do you want to stay focused, keep this in mind. Good quote, good wisdom impacted in this quote. When things go wrong, don't go with them. Hello? When things go wrong, don't go with them. I'm at the airport. I'm waiting to pick somebody up. And you all, if you travel, you've seen a Perth guy out there telling people to circle. And I was circling perhaps my seventh time, my eighth time, and he was getting on my last nerve. You know why he got on my last nerve? Because there was a young lady there that he was rapping to and trying to get a date with properly, and she didn't have to move. So I pulled right up behind her. And he said, hey, hey, keep moving. I said, no, buddy. When she goes, I go. And I got out of my car and told him. I said, hey, I don't have any problem with you rapping to this lady here, but don't let me run all my gas out while you're here trying to get your game on. And so he called for backup. I said, you can call anybody you want to call. <laughs> okay. And fortunately, you know, God looks out for babies and fools. <laughs> lady walked up. She said, Mr. Brown. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, trouble is easy to get into and hard to get out of. Get back in your car and circle. I said, yes, ma'am. It's, you know, it's, it's good to have someone that can dis rub your thinking that can check you on your stuff and and what she was reminding but nobody knows him and i'm up here arguing with this guy he's got backup and when they come guess who they're going to put in handcuffs les brown and they don't know that chump i'm getting mad thinking about it right now come on tyrone i ought to send you up there because it's tyrone she Tyrone got a black belt in karate. Okay, Tyrone, it's all right. It's all right. Calm down. Yeah. He said, he should do you like that. I know. I know. He, he, he didn't need to know that you just made me Brown's baby boy. I know. Calm down, Tyrone. Just jump up and down, do it flips right now. So at any rate, there are things that's going to happen. Sometimes people will snap on you. I'm on the elevator in, at, at Emory Hospital, and, 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 they, and they clearly, you know, that you can only have four people on there at a time. Then this guy going to run and jump on there to be the fifth person. I said, excuse me, sir. This, you see these spots here? This is a one there, two, three, four. You're not supposed to be in the middle of us. We don't know you. He looked at us and said, and waved his hand. And I'm looking at him. And I'm saying to myself, you about to make me lose my mind up in here up in here and 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 he's one of those people that aggravate me who wear their mask beneath their nose mask beneath their nose then he had to sneeze and he went who's there? now there's a time when people sneeze you would say god bless you but now let me get the <laughs> but i'm on the elevator I can't get off. I said, hey, homie. I said, listen to me. You don't know me like that. I don't need to be in here breathing your sneeze. You better pull that up. Do you hear me? And he pulled it up. 
pull it up real quick. <laughs> real quick. Cause I was about to give him a touch up up in there, up in there. <laughs> so in this place where we are, it's a special time. What are the talents? What are the abilities? What are the skills? What are the ideas that you can be working on right now in and out of the pandemic that can change your life? See, a lot of people are caught up in the distractions. A lot of people spend all kind of TV time and, and internet time watching old fights and, and sporting events. But this is no time to be a fan. This is no time to be a spectator. Listen to me, listen to me. You have something special. You have greatness in you. And I, I, I believe that we all have built in, in greatness, but most people don't take the time to focus, to put in the effort and the time to develop that greatness, to discover that greatness. I'm going through an experience right now, I'm reeling. I just, here I am, 76. God is full of surprises. And I just laid eyes on my birth mother and father who were born in Gainesville, Georgia. Just laid eyes on them, showed a picture. And I met two brothers I have that I did not know, and a sister. And, and, and when we met, we were looking at each other and they all said, and I can hear them, Acts just like my birth mother was Dorothy Dorothy Bell Rucker, and her mother, my grandmother, Eula Rucker. They have the Rucker Museum, and they both were motivational speakers. Come on now, and people say, Well, it's in his DNA. What about my three brothers? Know the difference? I focused on this. I developed this. I spent time doing this. See, we all have built-in greatness. And if you don't focus, if you don't put in the effort, if you don't work it, it doesn't work if you don't work it. And they have chosen their path, and that's wonderful. And I say to you, when I was spending a day with Maya Angelou, she said, it aggravates me when people say that I'm a natural communicator. Show me a natural heart surgeon. They are trained. And she's right. This time where we are, God is up to some amazing stuff. This time where we are, there's a reckoning going on. This time where we are, Things are being exposed, the sheet, the curtain is being pulled back. This time where we are, we're seeing the rawness and the realness of where we are and what we've been dealing with. And it's going to take everything in you. You got to be hungry. It's going to take everything in you. Take no prisoners. So, so this place, God is up to some amazing stuff. And, and, and if you have this kind of mindset, that, that you are a miracle child, the things that God is going to do through you, for you, as you, and have this mindset, even if you don't have two pennies to rub together, have this mindset, even if you're going through foreclosure, I've been through that. Even if you've had your car repossessed, they repossessed my car at my cousin's house and, and his car at my house. <laughs> you know, I learned a long time ago to get back on your feet, all you have to do is miss three car payments. <laughs> oh, behave, hello. So listen, all that, it doesn't mean anything. What matters most, not what happens to you, but what happens in you. I was talking to Vanny last night, and, and, and sometimes you think you are going through some stuff, and you hear other people's story, you say, you know what? I'm good. <laughs> Vanny talked last night, and she talked about a family moving here from her country. And they used to get up at night with flashlights and look for night crawlers, the night crawlers, worms. Look for worms with, for, for, for several hours and put them in a can and sell them for $10 a can. For people 
to go fishing for bait. Macro, five years, over eight people packed in one room in pursuit of a dream, in pursuit of a better life. And she said something that was major last night. She says, do what you have to do. Do what you have to do to reach your goal, to reach your dream, to change your life. Do what you have to do. And see, a lot of people don't want to do what they have to do. You know what they don't want to do? They don't want to work, so they prefer to suffer. Commit thy works, that's internal work and external. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. See, you are more than a conqueror. I'm having a hot flash right now. Oh, behave. I call it a power surge. <laughs> Come on, Mickey Mouse, let me out. <laughs> you know Mickey Mouse. I'm sorry to tell you this, got my little Mickey Mouse man. I'm sorry to tell you this, but uh, I want you to know Tyrone don't like you. <laughs> Why are you so happy? As Orrin Hudson would say, it's the best day of my life and yours too. Why could, how could you say that? Because you're not taking a dirt nap. <laughs> if you don't think it's the best day of your life, try missing one. Hello? <laughs> so, when you focus on the possibilities, when you focus and put your energy on working on finding the solution, on knowing that this too shall pass. When you focus, as Willie Jolly would say, a setback is a setup for a comeback. You have comeback power. When you focus, you activate angels in your behalf that will open doors you did not see. You have something special. You have greatness in you. Yes, you do. And your circumstances, your situation, that does not determine it. That's why we are told, judge not according to appearances. There is mind sight and there is eyesight. People who, who judge with eyesight, who judge based upon what they see, but people who have mind sight, they call forth those things that be not. They live out of their imagination and not their history. They call forth those things that be not as though they were. Oh, that's why my son, John Leslie said, your faith is a down payment on your future. And that's why Adam Clayton Power, former congressman out of New York said, keep the faith, baby. Keep the faith, even as things are going on right now with all the divisiveness, with all the confusion, with all the lies, keep the faith, baby, and social distancing. Keep the faith, baby. You were born for greatness. You have built-in greatness. Keep the faith, baby. Uh, as one person said in life, you'll always be faced with a series of God-ordained opportunities, brilliantly disguised as problems and challenges. Oh, keep the faith. You were born to do great things.